All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Gallagher, Chair of Acquisitions and Collection Services at the University of Florida Libraries. And I'm here very pleased to be spending some time uh, with my friend and colleague, Lindsay Cronk. So, Lindsay, introduce yourself for us. I'm Lindsay Cronk. I'm Dean of Libraries at Tulane University. Um, and I've been in this job for, it'll be six months on the nose on wow. January the 1st. Um, it's an incredible place, just a wild, beautiful energy that I feel like sometimes you get really lucky. Um, and this is an institution whose audacity, sort of commitment to DIY, um, scrappiness generally, um, all sort of lends itself to, to my experiences and past true librarianship. So I just feel extraordinarily lucky to have landed here. Um, and Charleston was no small part of that is something I'll say. Wonderful. All right. Well, I want to hear more about that later. But I want to start with a little bit of background. And first of all, did you always want to work in libraries? And what was your library origin story? This is a really funny story. Um, so I always loved libraries. I absolutely had, um, my mom tells these stories of on Saturdays, I was, I was, a, I was a baby snoot. I was a tiny culture vulture growing up in suburban um, Chicago, Northwest Indiana. Um, and so my mom would take me to the local public library, I'd bike to the local public library in my hometown. And she'd give me a little bit of money so I could buy a sandwich. And I would like, I would read a book and then I'd take that book with me and I'd eat the sandwich while I read the book. And then I'd pick up more books to take home at the end of the day. And I would call from a payphone because this is where I'm really gonna date myself, Erin. I would call from a payphone, I would have a quarter. And I would call my mom and she would come back and pick me up. You know, or again, if it was if it was a nice day, which again, it's it's a little hit or miss, you know, um, in the, in that portion of the Midwest, it could be very very snowy. Um, I would I would get myself home, or my mom would pick me back up. There was also a wonderful, awful year of high school where I didn't have a lunch hour at the same time as my friends. So I would every day I would pick up a pack of pop tarts and sneak them into my school library. You weren't <laughs> actually allowed to have food there. Um, so I've always been a a big library person. I will say I always loved libraries, but I did. I didn't think it was a job you could get. Like I did not think it was it was a it was a job and it was only in it was 2008 and it was the financial crisis and I was doing some volunteer work actually with the local public library and they encouraged me to consider yeah. librarianship as a profession. Um and you know the rest sort of took care of itself but uh, at the time you know I was I was enjoying that meandering post college path like I'd I'd had two careers by the time I came to libraries one is sort of a a database administrator and then a second in, in donor relations and grant writing. Um, so all nonprofits um, and, you know, 2008, I think it did a number on a lot of us who had to do that work. Um, so I loved sort of transitioning from being the person who did the fundraising to the person who spends the money, which is, you know, like the collections path that led me straight to Charleston as well. Yeah, now, you know, the, the, the power that comes with wielding these massive library budgets, uh -huh. you know, just, it can't be underestimated, but I love that. I, uh, that's so heartwarming. I love a good library origin story that starts with, I was a kid and loved the library. And I think that's what so many of us have in common, even though what happens after that is usually vastly different for all of us. We all have like very unique journeys, but it starts with, I loved my library when I was a kid. I really love that. And you heard it here, folks. Uh, Lindsay Cronk ate pop tarts in the library when she was. Yes. Book, so. It was. It was not allowed. And I mean, like you know, have you like pest control becomes such a thing? Like particularly as a dean of a library in a southern state. Like I will tell you, I spent a lot more time thinking about like you know like those crumbs and what happens. So I, I have every sympathy, but also I think um, part of what makes a library special as opposed to like, again, a museum is wonderful, but you can't, you can't have a snack in a museum, a library, you can always have a snack. And I think that that's really important. And uh, also Southern librarian here, the pest situation is real, y'all. It is really, <laughs> it's a wild, wild, wild life here. Uh, so Lindsay, we were going through our MLIS programs around the same time, like the 2010, 2011, 2012 yeah. era. And so we're both more than 10 years out now. Um, so what do you think are some of the, I know, yay, what do you think are some <laughs> of the most vital values or skills that today's MLIS programs should be imparting to students? I actually, it's so interesting. I think about this a lot. Um, Rachel Fleming, one of my all-time favorite collaborators, and I did a Neapolitan on the topic of they didn't teach that in library school around acquisitions at, at, um, at the Charleston conference a few years back. And we actually got a fair amount of um, irritation from LIS programs 
that didn't actually pay attention to what we were saying, which was that we all needed to sort of absolve <laughs> yes, of, of its ability to prepare us or not for what librarianship looks like. Um, I would say um, my biggest thing for MLIS programs, and I, I think they are doing more of it now, because it was it was the thing that was most useful to me in my process, but it was something I, I sort of had to build for myself, particularly going to a hybrid program that was largely online, Valdosta State. So again, a, a program that does a lot um, mm -hmm. and delivers an excellent value. You know, at the time, like it was stressful because they were figuring out the accreditation process, but Linda Most and the whole team over there, they done a tremendous job. Um, but I had to build my own network, you know, and coming from um, a sort of different career path, which I still think was for me, absolutely the the right choice, you know, because we've all seen, I think, how sometimes if you're a paraprofessional and you get that degree, it isn't getting you what you need either. You know what I mean? Like there's, but that gap has everything to do with the way we make our jobs. And I don't think anything to do with the way programs, but there's a, there's a piece between all of that that I think um, to me is most important. And I would love to see programs focus in on most, which is experiential learning and networking. That's what I would say I think needs to be sort of focused in on. Yeah, I feel you there pretty hard. My, my program uh, at FSU in 2010 was entirely online, but it was a very new thing at the time. And I think that's the one thing that I still uh, lament was that there wasn't a real way to get to know the other people in your program. I mean, we were doing virtual group projects where we were just chat, you know, like chat messaging. I don't even think we had the ability to talk to each other or see each other. Um, and, but what is kind of funny is that now, every now and then, I don't know if this happens to you, but I'll be at a conference and I'll, you know, see somebody's name tag or get introduced to them. And I have this weird, like, Oh yeah, from somewhere, and and all it is is we had a bunch of classes together. Oh. Yes, it happens all the time. It did it. It doesn't help build community, right? And that's so much of what like li library ship is, and what, how library practice actually gets transmitted and shared. You know, um, so it's it's something that I noodled on a lot. Um, and there was something I was thinking of too, like the that aspect of I I hope that it's falling away more. Like, I do remember when I entered the job search too, there was still a fair amount of skepticism about those those online programs. Yes, yeah. And it, it kind of baked in a little bit of chip on my shoulderness. Like yeah. I never felt like an imposter and everyone who knows this, knows this about me, um, I felt like a bandit queen, you know, but I, I was, I was deeply, I was always a little irritated by it because it, it does, it reaps it reeks of a certain classism, yeah. right? Like it's, it's just like, um, I think that there are like, you know, like in retrospect, I wish I had gone to an high school, maybe if I could have found the money, but I didn't have it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm really interested in how do we actually take down some of those barriers to the best quality of LIS education? Um, and, and, you know, like cost barriers, particularly given what librarians are paid is, is the other thing I, I think about a lot. Well, and I think I, my, I, my hope is that that is dismantling. And the reason I think it is, is uh, in my experience, so many of my staff right now in my department, um, a couple of my staff are going through MLIS programs right now. One is actually at Valdosta State and she loves it. And um, the the reason this works- I, is, is, I think that's yeah, cool. right. But <laughs> I think what we're seeing so much more are folks who are already working in libraries and who just want to get that degree because they want to spread their wings even more. They want more opportunity. So why in the world would we expect someone who's already got a really great career and a really great position and want to stay in that position while they work through library school to somehow just go and move somewhere that has an in-person program? I think it's it's pretty unrealistic. So my hope is that, uh, you know, that that is kind of going by the wayside. All right, so you were the first elected president of CORE, which is very exciting. Uh, so CORE, super familiar with this, folks, especially, you know, in various realms of uh, the back. Ah, oh, wow. That this was is my CORE gavel. So I, I'm breaking out an object. We're doing a little object-based learning here. But um, yeah, this is, yeah. We have props. I did not expect props, but I love it. Uh, <laughs> So CORE is the division of ALA, American Library Association, that is committed to advancing the profession in various areas. And we're talking like buildings and operations, leadership and management, metadata and collections, uh, technology, you know, the sorts of things that you and I are steeped in day to day. And you recently wrapped up your year as past president. So this was a, you know, this is a big leadership um, uh, commitment here. And I'm wondering, how did you 
learn leadership and who are some of your leadership inspirations? Yeah, it's um, CORE was such a tremendous and generous sort of learning opportunity. And before I became president, I was part of, it was, um, and there's another, like, again, there's so much CORE stuff over here. Um, my Association of Library Collections and Technical Services Presidential Citation, which had to do with the work that I did on the communications working group to just, this was um, formed by the merger of three past ALA divisions. Mm -hmm. um, and like the, it's such an interesting case study. I cite it all the time. I, I, I do think it's a huge part of the reason I got the job at Tulane was that I could describe what it was like to figure out how to bring three organizations together, mm -hmm. um, how to communicate effectively, and create on the other side of that, like start to, to create the conditions for forming a shared identity, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just, you, you when you stick things together, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to coalesce yeah. into something new. It takes a lot of care and feeding. Um, so I learned leadership um, through every phase of that process. Like I learned how to listen better. I learned how to take and challenge negative feedback in some cases, because mm -hmm. I got some really like, Core was tough. Like there's a, I have a blog post about it. If anyone wants like that deep dish, because I promised myself in the midst of, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to write this for me. Like mm -hmm. on the other side of this, I'm going to give myself this outlet because parts of it were um, the, there's a, there's passive aggressiveness that like we play out in our national organizations. I think because we don't necessarily always feel a sense of power within them in the same way we don't feel that sense of power within our organization. And I will say that was like the deepest and hardest piece of learning I took about leadership through the whole thing was um, even when you are working with all the best intentions, even when you're using all of the best change management approaches, even when you are, you know, turning and looking at um, like, I'm looking here at my bookshelf, like I've got my Radical Candor by Kim Scott, you know, I've got my The Power Code by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman. Um, I've got, you know, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, Marshall Gil I read a lot. I, I believe very firmly, you know, like, and not to be too much of a librarian in it, that thinking really intentionally about leadership and being a reflective leader is hugely important and acknowledging that you can always improve. Um, it's sort of my guiding principle. Like I, but with core, it was a lot of beginning to understand and contextualize organizations as groups of individuals, hmm. you know, and individuals as being idiosyncratic and difficult and interesting and creative and incredibly cool. Um, and it, it did, it, it fundamentally changed the way that I lead and that I manage, um, I think for the better. Uh, I am a, I'm a stronger less listener. You know, I read uh, change your question, change your life mm -hmm. um, through that. You know, we did, we did focus groups, we did weekly office hours and, and it taught me a lot about, again, change management and particularly consistency as, as, and this is interesting to sort of remark on because I don't think um, people think Lindsey Kronk consistent, <laughs> but like it is my watchword. It is the single most important thing I do as a leader all the time is I set and keep routines. I set expectations and I enforce them. You know, it, people need that regularity to have the frame in which they can thrive and be creative. Um, and so those were the four was simultaneously and remains like the biggest, wildest collective experiment I've ever been a part of. Um, and my single most rewarding service opportunity and the single biggest pain in my ass <laughs> right? like, all wrapped into one because it was, it was everything all at once. Um, and it's been just so thrilling now to see that um, the division has turned the corner is financially stable, right? Like we are growing members. The the um, election slate, which I was responsible for this year, um, we had every position in like a strong set of potential nominees, which felt very, very good. We're still struggling with aspects of diversity. You know, I think yeah. the entire profession is core is not exempt from any of the challenges you see in your library. Um, and that's what makes it such a, such a powerful organization and such a good, um, a sort of like a learning opportunity for me, but also a, a, a sort of shared sandbox for everyone. Like it's, it's, it's more inventive and more, um, elastic, I would say than some other corners of ALA, just because it's newer. And that was also its own sort of, um, I had a, a number of epiphanies about ALA and its challenges as a sort of counterpoint to core, which 
because we were starting everything from scratch, there were all of the challenges of that, but there were also all the benefits. You know, you get to lay the ground rules and it, you can make everything then much more legible and sensible instead of retroactively trying to take this big bylaws, this giant organization and turn it into something else. So um, yeah, how did I learn leadership? Uh, mostly through listening. And some of my, most of my inspiration came from, uh, you know, like friends and colleagues and mentors that I made along the way. Like I think a lot about Andromeda Yelton, Hong Ma, I think about uh, Bo Yun Kim, I think about uh, Viva Weinrob, uh, just powerful, cool women who took a chance on me early on. Like I am, I became president of CORE because I was an agitator in Lita and I became an agitator in Lita because Andromeda saw something in me. Um, it's just all about um, how do we create those networks and make those networks more equitable. I love that. And I can, I'm sensing a theme here uh, with, you know, the network and community and support. And um, I, I love to see that. That's one thing I love about our profession is that I do see a lot fewer um, big egos in our communities than I would perhaps in other sectors. You know, I started out working for a vendor and I can tell you that like there's a massive difference there, yes. but um, you know, no shade, of course, there's really wonderful vendor partners. I love no shade. But yeah, really yeah, Aaron, I'm totally there with you. And like, the thing is too, I think that there's um, as someone who's a big personality, you know, like a big personality, you can be a big personality without having a big ego, without throwing yeah. your ego in the way of people's yeah. work. Like, right, like I try to use my big voice, my big personality, whatever possible to just sort of elevate and bring all mm -hmm. of that up. Um, and I just have a, I have a deep love and appreciation for people who are, who bring different perspectives, you know, like, like my, I, I joke all the time, like my closest friends are introverts. <laughs> they just barely tolerate me, you know, but, um, I think that is, I think it's deeply important. Like if you're just hanging out with people who are reinforcing your opinions all the time, you're not going to have a healthy organization. Yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to build a healthy profession. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And that is a problem in libraries. And, um, so I'm glad that really what I'm, what I'm thinking now is that, uh, 10 years from now, I'm going to be interviewing someone asking them this question and they're going to be saying, well, Lindsey Cronk was a huge inspiration to me in leadership. I really mean it. I think you're, you are, um, the product of some strong female leaders and you're now helping to, uh, move that chain forward. But so speaking of, uh, you know, communities of practice and, and networking, you have an obvious passion for mentorship. And uh, this is very evidenced by your co-founding of Pimento and uh, not the Pimento Pepper, but P-E-M-E-N-T-O, which is a peer mentoring cohort for mid-career librarians. Uh, this is really near and dear to my heart because as someone who feels like I'm very nested in mid-career, I think it can often come with a sense of um, accomplishment, but a sense of um, maybe just sort of melting into yourself and not really knowing where you're going to go from here. So can you tell us more about how you conceived of Pimento and specifically why mid-career librarians need the support at our, this stage in our careers? Yeah, no one made fun of me, but, um, I was hitting that mid-career mark and I was feeling like, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm -hmm. And I was also, I was, um, I was really struggling with the fact that there, like, you know, there's so much training early, you know, like there's so much, like, like the, if you're, um, you can seek out the trainings around leadership, you can seek out the leader, the trainings around skills, you can seek out like great professional development early into your career. It's, it's, it can feel, it feels sequential in a way that like hits a nice spot in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> like, like for me, yeah. I love the dopamine hits of, of prog process, progress. Um, it's the reason I, I, on the collection side of librarianship, I've always enjoyed like stacks management. I like to be able to see the evidence of my work, you know? Um, and so that was true at mid-career and I was finding it mid-career that it wasn't true. It didn't help. Um, it also sprung out of COVID. Right. Like, so I was, I was feeling even more disconnected on, on a scale. And I was having this conversation, um, with my, my friend and colleague actually from Lita and she's amazing. Brianna Marshall. She's now at, um, Northern Kentucky. I don't want to butcher her title, but she's amazing. And she's an interim Dean. And if you have not had the chance to hang out with her, she has some absolutely incredible ideas. And so we were having this conversation and we were just like, if you and I are feeling this way as these big extroverts, right? Like these, these people who are like we have, like I have text chains. I have, you know, like I have people to talk to. If we're feeling this sense of isolation, lack of direction, et cetera, 
this is a problem for way more people. <laughs> like, like this, we are literally the tip of the iceberg. And I was like, at that point, I was, um, I manage chronic illness. Um, I have uh, multiple sclerosis. And so during COVID, like, and it's still COVID, you know, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dance or mince around it. But there were, there was a period of like eight months where I could not go anywhere or see anyone, you know, and it was, it was tough. It was very tough on my, my mental health. And I had a lot of anxiety about it. So even though I was doing the core stuff, and I was doing all kinds of other stuff as well, I was just like, I need this. I'm building this for me. Um, and then it was, it was sort of a delight, you know, like, again, to see how impactful it is for so many people. And it's it, the sort of ongoing, um, the ongoing gift of Mendo, what it reminds me of all the time is for me, I always feel better when I'm helping people. Mm -hmm. Helping people helps me. Mm -hmm. um, turning outward helps me. Mutual aid is cause for celebration, right? Like our community is cause for celebration. It is not a burden. And I do think like um, during the worst of COVID and the worst of like the, the coming back from COVID, I detected some of that broadly across the profession. Like, like it is some sort of a, a tough lift to ask people to be in community with each other. And I honestly think, um, I'm just going to say this, this is, this will probably be my hottest take of this and someone's going to get mad about it. I think that that's actually evidence of, of trauma and issues of, of broad scale issues of mental health within our profession. Like, and I, I think all of that is truly justified, but we also have to come back together to heal. And so, um, again, the design of that, um, for mid career, particularly was when you're, when you're winding down your career too, there's all kinds of stuff you got to do. There's a checklist. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, again, there's that sequence of activity. There's you figuring out and determining it. So, so Pimento was designed to help people who like me, like to know a roadmap, like to know what's coming, make it for themselves and make it for themselves with others who can help sort of clarify or affirm or challenge. Um, and we've had just incredible outcomes with that program. Thanks for the question, Erin. I, uh, you know, um, I'm right there with you on the mental health issues and the shift that I feel in our profession post COVID. I think a lot of times, um, folks in leadership positions in particular, maybe have felt it because it manifests as leadership challenges that we didn't have prior to COVID. And I think you just articulated it so well that it's really hard to get people to just get together physically in a room again now without it feeling like an immense amount of work, without feeling like you're drawing upon the deep well of willpower within you to just interact with another human face to face. It is so hard. And as someone who isn't a natural extrovert, like I'm, I'm a high functioning introvert, but still pretty introverted. I felt that strongly. And, um, I, what I what I hope is happening is that by slowly bringing people back together in a physical space and just having one experience of a shared in-person meeting where we go out of it and people, the, the same people who were exhausted before that come out of it feeling energized and feeling like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that that was going to feel so good. My hope is that that's really um, on the rise I, I do see it with my staff here at UF actually. And it, it's very heartening to see that, you know, the more time we spend together in person, the more time we want to spend together in person. But yeah, it's um, that trauma was real. And I'm right there with you on that. Yeah. But flipping gears a little bit, I want to get into like some fun, a little bit more fun. <laughs> uh, so tell me about how you got involved with the Charleston conference and what you most look forward to in going there every year. Well, Charleston always feels like home base to me. Charleston feels like the conference I grew up at. It's the conference that raised me in a really meaningful way. So, um, and I've been to everyone. I went to the weird one in the immediate. Because <laughs> like, again, I was, I was so hungry for like, like, you know, it was, it was funny. I was sitting in a, I was sitting in a session that had a, a speaker on a screen with Lisa Hinchcliffe. And I was just like, this is still great. Like yeah. this even this most awkward version of this. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I got involved in the Charleston conference. Actually, the first time I attended, I was lucky. I was working for my first vendor job, which was Lyricist. Um, so I was working at Lyricist and Celeste Feather let me tag along. And I was so grateful. Um, and I just spent the entire thing. I was like a, I was like a sponge just mm -hmm. soaking it up. 
because I my work at Lyricist, which eventually I would be able to translate into an academic context. Um, but I was I was helping to manage like e-resource portfolios for 1,400 member libraries at that point in time. Um, and I was doing member support work, and then later I did member engagement work. Um, but it was this firsthand like interaction where I got to hear more of what the actual pain points were, mm -hmm. what the frustrations were. And I was like, this is amazing. It also gave me the chance to um, connect with Charlie Remy in person, who's one of my all-time favorite people in libraries. Shout out, Charlie, if you're watching this. Um, recently moved to Dartmouth, um, just living his best New England life. But Charlie Remy um, made a point of saying I was, I was feeling my way and I'd been sort of like, again, I, I was, as with everything in librarianship, some, some aspects of it just feel entirely like, accidental serendipitous and I love that part of it mm -hmm. like ultimately you know like I engineered lots of it but Charlie or me made a point of like making sure he took me out to coffee and making sure that I felt like welcomed and that was my my feeling throughout that first conference was and it wasn't true I'm gonna I'm gonna counterpoint it my very first ALA um I actually got hissed at on an elevator while wearing a vendor badge like 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 and it, it was like I get where the lady was coming from like with the joke but she like just full like she was like this and she was like vendor like like I was a vampire or something and I was like very stressed out by this because you know like when you're making these choices you'll remember this you're like have I made the wrong choice am I just gonna have to like like and I, I liked working in a vendor well enough but I definitely wanted to work in a library right yes. like like that which is another one of those sort of like hurdles that lives in your mind and I was like I'm just gonna get stuck in this box forever like and instead at Charleston I was like, no, this is going to work out. Like I see the connections and the threats. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I started to get involved. Um, and then from there, I got my first like a couple of presentations that I had like one wild conference where I did a pre-conference and a like too many presentations. Like, you know, like what I love about Charleston is, and y'all like, and I want to, Leah is just incredible. Katina, like, like the whole team. Um, I really feel like at some point, like people were like, let's give that Lindsay Cronk, you know, the opportunity. Like she has some interesting things to say. And I always felt so supported in that, you know, like, and that's the community that Charleston is, you mm -hmm. know, like you, you connect with people and you connect across those bridges. I mean, it's the first place I connected with, like, like the people that were big, like, again, big names to me, like, like when I met Todd Carpenter for the first time, when I met like Roger Schoenfeld for the first time, like, I was like, oh, that's that guy from Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Or I'm sorry, X R I P. Like I'm not <laughs> it's anymore. Totally I forever to me. So. It's like it's like deep tears to me. But um, so like yeah, like that was that was Charleston. Charleston gave me a home in the profession in, in a whole new way. And it's actually how I found my way to the Acquisitions Institute, which I also highly recommend to people. Um, as a sort of teeny tiny like single track Charleston option, um, which I don't, you know, it doesn't get as much uh, me play as it should. But yes, I just, I mean, it's just it's the best conference. Like if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, like you just get to eat and learn. And there's the acknowledgement. I think that as full people, it's not just about shuffling around rooms in a conference center. It's about like the conversations that happen in between. No conference does it better. Yeah. You know? I'm not getting, I'm not getting paid for this interview in case anyone's asking. Oh. I can attest to that. None of us are <laughs> no, but really hard relate on that, on the, the Charleston is, is gives you a chance. I think it's really such a great incubator for, you know, early career folks. It's such a safe, welcoming place to give your first presentation. Uh, you know, that was my first place that I, I gave my presentation, which actually this was back in the day when they still did, did the happy hour sessions. So my yeah. first presentation was a happy hour presentation and it was just such a blast. And uh, so, yeah, and most, many of my staff, that is their first opportunity to present is with Charleston. And I always tell them like, hey, you're gonna have a friendly audience. You're gonna have friendly attendees. The worst thing that might happen is folks are like buried in their phones, but you know, you're gonna have a good, good friendly, uh, non-threatening group. All right, so you're a big reader, no surprise there. Although I am sometimes surprised when I talk to people in, librarianship and they're big readers but what's the best book you've read this year oh my gosh okay so I am I'm neck deep right now in Barbara Streisand's autobio and I just mm. can't recommend it highly enough if you like me like that hot hot dish like that gossip Barbara's I mean it, it is dense it is a thousand pages I have dropped it in my tub not once but twice but <laughs> it, um, it's just a great juicy memoir it's fabulous 
So as I, I as I quote you, libraries are radical. Uh, and so is Damon Bowie. So I was <laughs> peeping, on on your, peeping on your blog post and I happen to see, you know, you're a Bowie fan. You're oh my God. Oh, <laughs> jealous. That's coming with me to every office. That is gorgeous. I love it. So I'm also a fan. Uh, you know, I grew up on Ziggy Stardust. And so that album is imprinted absolutely on my soul. But I was wondering, what are, what would be some of your like go-to Bowie recommendations for a new listener? So I always, I always suggest Hunky Dory. I think it's so accessible and it's so, it's so lovely. It's, it, I mean, it, that's the one, it has life on Mars. It has changes. Like it's underrated at this point and it has maybe my single favorite, like again, like all Bowie, many Bowie tracks that you don't think are bangers or bangers, but Oh, You Pretty Things is maybe mm-hmm. one of my most single most listened to songs. Like I almost walked down the aisle to it. We wound up dancing to Heroes instead. So we didn't, we didn't do like heroes heroes is incredible uh i would say uh shoot i mean late bowie gets overlooked a lot too so i would say um yeah i love scary monsters in the 80s has some tracks that'll blow your mind um and and then my my deep cut bowie pick like for when you get into it station to station it's just like everyone's so obsessed with low and I understand why but I think station to station is is so much more like full and imaginative in its way like low is it's I love like speed of light which is that one like instrumental track on it but um the other day like someone mentioned that there's some list of like the best songs that are over seven minutes and I was like you know I'm not necessarily interested in like what other people have to say about that, but like Station to Station would be very high on my list of songs, along with um Shine On You Crazy Diamond, right? Like like over seven minute long songs that are just, I encourage you to listen to them. I don't care if you think they're bloated. I think that they're spectacular and I love every second of them. So the man who taught me everything I know about interviewing, which is uh, against the grain's own Tom Gilson, he would always end the uh, Charleston interviews with, a question that now I like to end with, which is, is there anything that you wish I'd asked in this interview that I didn't? Oh, man. You know, I'm always really interested in, I know not everyone likes this, Erin, and I don't have a really good answer for it, but a question that I'd love for you to put to other people is, what do you think is coming next? Right? Like, like I love, I love, and we, um, in, at Charleston, I would say like those sessions tend to be like ones that sometimes make me groan a little, but I do think that thinking future forward is, is vitally important. And it's something that I'd love to hear more from sort of like, again, the practitioner side than the like, you know, oftentimes we bring in a futurist or it's like a, you know, like someone from, and those are, those are fine. Those are great, but you always have to extrapolate then like, oh, well, what he's saying about, you know, like, like culture change affects and interacts with my work on this level. Yeah. Like it requires that um sort of secondary step you know and so i i you know like what's coming next and I, i'd love honestly to turn that question to you if you don't mind gosh i tend to um i feel like i'm so steeped anymore in the world of human connection human management yes. change, change management um and i don't i wish i had a better answer but i think what's next is that we are we as a profession are going to have to be way more intentional about making some tough changes and maybe even leaning into some things that we think are uncomfortable or inconvenient if we want to re- attract and retain people human beings on an individual level who are um, we are not going to either burn out within a couple of months because they're incredibly high performing or ignore because they aren't exactly what we think a high performing library worker should look like. And I I genuinely don't know what that looks like, but I know that that has become more and more of my day to day is how do I make sure that my people are still, still retain whatever light that was lit inside of them to make them want to come work in this library and be public servants and get paid less than they might in a corporate sector because they want to be here. Like, how can I make sure that that's not just getting snuffed out? It's not an answer that's tangible, but it's really what I think is coming is that we're going to have to focus more on the people that we have and um, how we make sure that they, they stay here for the right reasons. Honestly, Erin, 
I love that answer more than I've loved almost any other answer. So thanks for taking it on. <laughs> well, I have really loved this discussion so much, Lindsay. Seriously, it's been energizing and it's making me wish that we were going to Charleston like next week again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you so, so much for talking to me. And I, I really genuinely look forward to seeing you next year in Charleston, if not before. You will. And it, watch your inbox. I'm going to invite you here as well. Thanks oh, for the opportunity, Erin. Oh, thank you.